This is Professor Lynn Porter from Fairfield University, and this is the third of my three lectures on genre for my Intro to Theater class. In this lecture, I'm going to be going over our last two genres, melodrama and domestic drama. And I'm going to switch things up a bit this time. When I talked about tragedy and comedy, I started by talking about the effect those genres have on us as audience members. After that, I talked about all of the ingredients of the recipes for those genres. When I talk about melodrama and domestic drama, I'm going to start with the recipes and then move along to the effect that these genres have on us. In making this lecture, I searched out images that somehow expressed the idea of melodrama and domestic drama. Tragedy and comedy is simple, right? We have the comedy and tragic masks from ancient Greece. This one's a little different because there's no melodrama mask. So this image here, I think, is really quite telling. In this one snapshot, you have everything that goes on in melodrama. So let's look at this for a second. What's going on here? Well, in the middle, we have some woman, obviously in deep distress, highly emotional state, and she's holding off the guy in the hat, the dude with the big mustache. What's up with him? He's coming after her for some reason. He has a piece of paper that's important. It must be one of those important papers like a mortgage or, or a marriage license or something, one of those really important papers we have in life. But he's obviously really threatening to her. And then on the other side, Look, we have a clean-cut guy with perfect hair and a strong jaw fighting back, getting ready to defend our damsel in distress in the middle, right? That's the story that's being told here in this one image. And there you go. That is melodrama. Here is another image that says everything that's going on in a melodrama. In fact, this painting from the middle of the 1800s is titled Melodrama, painted by Honoré Daumier. So what's going on in this picture? In the center, in white, we have a woman. Again, look at that, in some kind of highly emotional state, in deep distress. And then we have somebody laying dead on the floor or passed out or something. And another guy who somehow is in the middle right? So we've got that thing going on. But look, that's actually happening on stage in this picture. So let's look at the rest of the picture. Actually, the bigger images in the picture are the audience. So focus in on them. What's going on with their faces? They're all leaning forward. They're all deeply engaged. They're all emotionally engaged. And they're all intent on this. They're all very emotionally connected to what's happening in this play. Here is another image that shows what's going on in a melodrama. This is an image from The Perils of Pauline, a really famous film serial from 1914. What's going on here? Look at that, a woman in distress. Good Lord, she is being tied to the train track. She's being She's being chained into place so the coming train will kill her. Oh, no. And we have three really bad guys with big hats. And look at that mustache. Again, a big mustache. So this is, this is melodrama. There's, there's these very, very high stakes, kind of over-the-top stakes. I mean, seriously, that mustache? Seriously, the size of that hammer? It's a little over-the-top. And honestly, how many bad guys tie damsels in distress to train tracks? I mean, it's really over the top. And that is also a part of melodrama. And of course, I cannot talk about melodrama without mentioning some of my favorite characters from the cartoon world. Here we have Dudley Do-Right in the center. He's a Canadian Royal Mountie. You can tell that from his rather silly uniform. Again, look at that incredibly strong jawline. And then you have a beautiful young woman, a damsel in distress. I believe her name is Nell. And 
Who's the other guy? Oh, wow. He is really scary. He's got a stovepipe hat. His skin is kind of green. Wow. He wears a scary cape. He's got a long pointy nose and, oh, man, there's that mustache again. This character's name is Snidely Whiplash. So Dudley Do-Right, Nell, and Snidely Whiplash. Trust me, in every episode of this cartoon, Snidely Whiplash would kidnap Nell, tie her to the train tracks, and it would be Dudley Do-Right's job to gallop up on his horse and rescue Nell from this dastardly guy. So in all of these images that I say are iconic melodrama images, we have the similar themes of a person in distress, frequently a woman, a good guy there to protect her, and a really bad guy there to put them all into some kind of horrible distress. That's melodrama. So let's do more than just look at cool pictures. Let's unpack the recipe for melodrama in the same way we did before with tragedy and comedy. We'll look at characters, language, plot direction, and plot resolution. Starting off with character, in melodrama, we have a focus on two different characters. Sometimes they're sets of characters. Usually it's two individual characters. As before, we have a protagonist. And this is the character who is the good guy. That's the character we're going to root for. In the image still on the screen, that would be Dudley Do-Right. I mean, his name, Dudley Do-Right. It already tells you that he's on the right side of the law. And then on the other side, we have a bad guy. And this is the first time I'm using the term antagonist. Of course, we know the antagonist works against the protagonist. Most of us learn that somewhere in high school. But here I have to point out, in melodrama, you are required to have an antagonist. An antagonist is a character, not a force of nature, not the giant meteor hurtling toward Earth, not that kind of a problem, but an antagonist is a character. And so what we have going on in a melodrama is a required protagonist and a required antagonist, a very, very clear-cut good guy, bad guy scenario. The distinction is really, really clear. You can very clearly tell who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. You have a Canadian Royal Mountie, and you have a bad guy with a mustache. How could you not tell that he's the bad guy? This fight between a good guy and a bad guy situation, that is the beating heart of a melodrama. And I have to point out that these characters are pretty simple. They're not characters that we get to know in a deep way, like we come to understand their inner psychology and the things that make them tick. Actually, we rarely know what makes them tick. All we know is that's the good one, that's the bad one. I also have to point out that I'm using this good guy, bad guy terminology, and there's two things about this. First, they're not necessarily male. And then there's the good and bad question. It's not necessarily the moral character who is the good guy. Sometimes in a melodrama, the protagonist, the character that we're rooting for, is an outlaw. But in those situations, the bad guys are corrupt law enforcement people that they're fighting against. So melodrama always has this huge extreme of two opposites. And of course, these two extreme characters are in high conflict. So what about the language that melodramas are written in? Just like comedies, this one is simple. They're written in everyday language. Melodramas are written in prose. All right, let's look at plot direction. What happens in a melodrama? Well, the situations we have are serious situations, and the conflict is highly exaggerated. Of course, that is a result of this good guy, bad guy situation. 
But even though we have high conflict, everything's exaggerated, emotion is running very, very high, we always feel as audience members that everything's going to turn out okay. Isn't that odd? High conflict, but it's going to be fine. We don't have that with comedy, do we? We don't have that with tragedy. This is interesting. In fact, the conflict is so high, we don't ever know about what's going on inside our characters. We focus on the external lives of our characters. We never learn about what makes our characters tick in any deep and substantive way. Think about it. With tragedy, we learn a ton about our characters' inner lives. We sure don't in melodrama. This is because melodramas focus on thrills and chills and spectacle. And what do I mean by spectacle? I mean things that attract our attention, things that we can't avoid watching. So we're talking about people fighting physically. We're talking about trains running, re running really quickly. We're talking about Tom Cruise hanging off a cliff by a fingernail. Oh my goodness, can he possibly hang there? How is that possible? It's that kind of spectacle that we're talking about in a melodrama. And how is this resolved? Since we have this emphasis on two distinct characters, this good guy, bad guy situation, and these high thrills, these high chills, we are going to have a double ending. And you know how it turns out. The good guy wins and is rewarded. The good guy always wins. But what else happens? The bad guy loses and loses badly. The bad guy doesn't just lose, the bad guy is punished. So you have this reward and punishment situation too. And you may be thinking, I don't know if I've ever seen a melodrama. I can guarantee that you have seen lots of melodramas. When you go into your Netflix queue, they're called thrillers. So what happens in a thriller? You have a good guy who's going to do the impossible, fighting the bad guy who's really, really bad. And, they, and the bulk of the movie is crazy, crazy, crazy things that honestly would never happen in real life. And the good guy solves the problem and the city is saved and also is rewarded, often by getting the girl. And then the bad guy loses, and oh, and then they're punished. And every single superhero movie follows this outline. So, yes, you have seen many melodramas. Now, most of us really love thrillers. I know I do myself. I wonder why. There must be a particular effect that this structure has on me as an audience member. How does melodrama work on us as audience? We know the circumstances in thrillers are just ridiculous. They would never happen in real life. So why do we love them so much? So in these huge, over-the-top battles between good and bad, what do we think about? We think about justice. We think about fair play. We see clearly wrong characters being defeated by clearly right characters. And bonus, we have these heart-pounding, engaging, thrilling battles happening in, in thrillers. And even though they're scary, even though they're emotionally tense, we always know everything's going to turn out okay. That is so satisfying to our souls, isn't it? And that's a way to remind us that all of us have to play by the rules. In melodramas, the situation is always black and white. It's very, very clear who we're supposed to be siding with in any given melodrama. And don't we find that calming? Isn't that something satisfying to our souls? Because we don't live in a black and white world. We live in a gray world where it's hard to tell sometimes, should we do this or should we do that? It's hard to tell. In everyday life, we have to struggle to find the right way. 
melodramas remind us that it's very clear there are rules. So melodramas are actually a form of socialization for us. They're a way that we as a culture reinforce the rules of the culture. We learn through melodramas what's the right way, the expected way to interact with others in society. We also get the satisfaction of seeing the bad guy lose and the bad guy get punished because that doesn't happen in everyday life too. Sometimes it does, but many times it doesn't. And that's really frustrating for us, especially those of us on the right side of the law. Wait a minute, that guy ran me off of the road. Why isn't he getting a ticket too? Because the world isn't fair, but the world in melodramas is very fair and it is very just. So melodramas calm us because they give us what we want in the world, though we frequently don't get it in the real world. So there you go. That is melodrama. And that gets us to our fourth genre, domestic drama. Here we have the wonderful cast from the television show, This Is Us, beautiful domestic drama. And here is a photograph from Downton Abbey, another great example of domestic drama. Before I unpack the recipe here, I want to point out that, that there is a gap in the kinds of drama that we've been seeing so far. Think about it. Tragedy is all about making the noble, ethically right choices. And comedy is about ridiculous, upside-down choices. Melodrama is these simple, black-and-white, clear-cut, right-and-wrong situations. But we don't yet have a genre that helps us deal with everyday situations. And that is where domestic drama comes in. So let's see how this all works. First, in terms of characters, our focus is going to be on normal, everyday people, people who look like you and me, people who you think you would run into in the grocery store. We have normal, everyday people. We don't have overridingly noble people like in tragedy or ridiculous people like we see in comedy or even the good guy, bad guy thing that we have in melodrama. These are regular people, regular people. That's what domestic drama is about. And as always, we have a protagonist. Now, sometimes we have one single protagonist like we have found with our other genres, but domestic drama is the only genre in which it's possible to have a group protagonist, a whole family of characters. And that's, and that's why I've chosen the images for this genre that are whole families of people. If you were to look at This Is Us or Downton Abbey, you could not name an individual protagonist. Maybe in one episode, the storyline is this one character. In another episode, the main storyline is another character being emphasized. But in total, the in domestic drama is about all of these people. Now, I'm using the word family, but let me put that into air quotes because it's not necessarily a biological family. Sometimes we see domestic dramas that follow medical professionals or a group of people studying the law. It doesn't have to be a family family. It has to be a group of characters. But more than the fact that it's a group of characters, I want you to understand that these are everyday people. You've these are people you feel like you could sit down and have a cup of coffee with. So take a guess. What kind of language are we going to have in this domestic drama about everyday people? Of course, you were right. Everyday language. These are everyday people. They would use everyday language. And of course, we call that prose. So we have normal people using normal everyday language. I wonder what kind of situations they're going to be in. It's obvious we're going to have the situations that happen in normal life, the normal problems of the family or the home. And that's where it gets the name domestic drama, because domestic means home. Usually these situations tend to be serious, like many of the situations in our lives. 
but there's a difference from the kind of seriousness that we have in our other genres. The play is not a tragedy because you don't have that fork in the road and that kind of godlike nobility that we see in tragedies. And it's not as simple and clean as a melodrama. Domestic dramas deal with the gray situations in everyday life that we all face, not the black and white situations that we find in a melodrama. Of course, domestic dramas can be funny too, or can be lighthearted, just like everyday life can be funny or lighthearted. You tend to have the full range of emotions that you tend to have in a normal day-to-day -day life. And how do we feel it's all going to end? Just like in everyday life, you have a sense that it may not have a happy ending. A tragedy has a very clean ending, often bloody, but a clean ending. Comedy has a clean ending. Melodrama has a clean ending. But domestic drama can often be messy, just like everyday life is messy. So while watching a domestic drama, we're aware that the ending could be positive or negative. So how does it all end? Of course, we resolve the conflict. However, we don't see the protagonist suffering and sacrificing themselves for the greater good like we find in a tragedy. And we don't have the ridiculous inverted upside downness of comedy. And we don't have that simple good bad situation of a melodrama. We resolve the conflict in a domestic drama just like we resolve the conflict in everyday life. Sometimes it's good for our characters. Sometimes it's bad for our characters. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just messy. Now, all of us love domestic dramas, too, just like we love tragedies and comedies and, and melodramas. So what is it that we as audience members get from experiencing these situations and problems of normal everyday people. The domestic drama honors the fact that everyone faces problems in life. A domestic drama helps us deal with everyday situations with everyday people. And going back to that concept of empathy, domestic dramas help us walk in other people's shoes, walk in other people's experiences, in a way that we find very fascinating and interesting and life-affirming. All of the genres satisfy pieces of our, of our souls. But domestic drama seems to help us connect more with other people who are just like us. They may not look like us. They could be from a different race. They could be from a different culture. They could be from a different corner of the world, a different time even. But we can connect across using our empathy. So that is the recipe and the effect of domestic drama. Now that I've unpacked all four genres, I want to caution you. When you are looking at a play or a movie or a TV show and trying to determine its genre, I, I recommend that you look at all four genres. Because if you, let's say, look at a piece and think, oh, I empathize, therefore it must be a domestic drama, you're going at it backwards. Look at it first as a tragedy, because tragedy requires empathy right? Is, does it meet the requirements of tragedy? Does it have that fork in the road? Is there this noble right-wrong situation? I'm choosing the right path despite the fact it might kill me situation. And if it doesn't, great. Then move along to comedy. Is it upside down? Is it ridiculous? Do you have that inversion? Do you have that examination of what's going on in society? If it's not a comedy, then is it a melodrama? Do you have that clear-cut, right, wrong, good, bad situation? And if not, then yes, it might indeed be a domestic drama. But you cannot just kind of plop yourself right into the question. You have to methodically go through all four genres. Or you may mistakenly assign the incorrect genre to your piece. Now I want you to think about it from the other side. Let's imagine you're a playwright. 
you might very well want your piece to have a particular effect on your audience. And that is where a playwright would be choosing which genre to be writing the drama in. I hope you're starting to see that genre is more than tragedies are sad and comedies make me laugh and melodramas get my heart pounding and domestic drama, I don't even know what that is. I hope you're starting to see that the different genres ask different things from us as audience members. All of the genres help us connect to various aspects of being humans in a social world. And that's one of the reasons why I call this section of our class community, because genre helps us connect to other people and other characters in very, very different ways. In fact, the various genres can make us question various elements of our lives and even inspire us to change things. Tragedies, while sad and horrible, leave us light and exhilarated. In fact, tragedies can heal us after we've had awful experiences in our lives. Comedies, through their ridiculousness, can also highlight negative aspects of our culture. Remember, comedies are about society. So comedy can be used as an engine for social change. Melodramas reassure us that being on the right side of a question can be its own reward. And domestic dramas reassure us that normal people can thrive, even when faced with rough patches. So genres are a major tool that we use in the theater to help us explore this experience of being human. That's it. Thank you for your attention.